Welcome to the College Recruiter webinar. The subject of today's discussion will be on Beyond 9 to 5, Acquiring and Retaining Talent in the Digital Age. My name is Andrea McEwen Henderson, and I will be your host today. I am one of the National Account Managers with College Recruiter. I have a dozen years of experience in helping large and small employers reach recent college graduates and students. My primary responsibilities are facilitating our webinars, moderating the discussions at our college recruiting boot camp conferences, as well as working with small to mid-sized employers on their entry-level hiring needs. College Recruiter is the highest traffic college job board with 150,000 unique monthly visitors. We help employers reach recent graduates and students of one, two, and four-year colleges and graduate schools. We have permission to deliver emails on behalf of our employer clients to 7 million recent graduates and 10 million students. We can also target them by major, school, year of graduation, diversity, and more. Our other solutions for employers include job postings, targeted mobile banner ads, targeted display ads, virtual career fairs, and custom research projects. For more information about College Recruiter, you can reach us at www.collegerecruiter.com forward slash contact or 952-848. 2211. Today's guest is Abe McCormick, author of Beyond 9 to 5, Your Career Guide for the Digital Age. Abe is an advisor on the digital economy, specifically in relation to work, workers, and leadership. He is a former Financial Times opinion columnist advising business leaders on the near future. Abe lectures from time to time at MIT Sloan School of Management on digital leadership and has written a number of books, including Beyond 9 to 5, Your Career Guide for the Digital Age, its most recent publication. I'll now turn over the webinar to Aid. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, before we get into the talent aspect of it, we need to understand some of the underlying drivers behind uh, what's uh, driving talent demand today. Now, if we look at this from an anthropological perspective, if we go back to the hunter-gatherer era, back then we were highly mobile, uh, we pursued our lunch across the savannah, uh, we were highly social, we had to coordinate our activities, otherwise lunch might eat us. Our work and our lives were highly integrated, and we were required to be very creative and to make decisions uh, in real time. So we, we were constantly making decisions and bad decisions uh, were frowned upon uh, by nature. We were also judged by our outputs in terms of number of berries picked, number of animals uh, captured and so on. Now that continued uh, through to the agricultural era around 12,000 years ago. Uh, but came to an abrupt halt uh, around uh, 200 years ago with the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, we had to turn up to this place called the factory, so mobility stopped. Instead of covering 10 to 15 kilometers a day, we were confined to, uh, in latter times, uh, the, a cubicle of several square meters. So we ceased to be mobile. Uh, we ceased to be social because we were being paid as labor, and consequently, uh, labor just has to get on with work and shouldn't be seen to be chatting. So you might say the concept of laziness was created during the industrial era, and in turn, the concept of management was created to stop lazy people being lazy, so to speak. So there was no socializing. We weren't mobile uh, because we were essentially placeholders in the factory machine for technology. Uh, we were not allowed to make decisions. We were not allowed to be creative. We were simply supposed to follow uh, the operational procedures for that part of the factory that we worked in. And that's kind of carried through to uh, what you might call modern day factories, offices uh, today. And as labor, we were simply just paid for our time rather than our outputs. So you might say that as we enter the digital age, uh, it's not just the industrial era on technology steroids. It's more fundamental than that. I, I would say that it is uh, mankind's uh, next, uh, well, I'd say it's more of an economic 
step change in terms of mankind returning to his or her true nature. So people today are expecting, in terms of their work, they're expecting to be mobile, they're expecting to be social, they're expecting to be creative and make their own decisions, and they're expected to have their, uh, to be rewarded in accordance with their outputs, not just the fact that they're being uh, present uh, all day. And one of the concepts that was invented in the industrial era was work-life balance, because we generally hated our work, but we looked forward to the evening, uh, we hated our job, uh, and we looked forward to the end of our lives. But as we enter the digital era, we will see work and life become much more integrated. And we'll get into that a little bit further. But essentially, the digital economy or the digital age is an economic step change. And there are anthropological drivers uh, pushing this. Uh, next, please. Now, as we'll see from this diagram here, uh, from this slide, uh, we are becoming somewhat augmented. You might say that we had the internet for people originally. It's become the Internet of Things, and as wearables become embeddables, it'll become the Internet of Things in people, and eventually it'll become the Internet of people, so to speak. So we're becoming very augmented thanks to technology, and that augmentation started the day we picked up a, 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 a stick and put a, a bit of stone on the end of it. So we've taken control of our, you might say, um, evolution as it were. The main point being that this so-called augmented person is an augmented employee, is an augmented user, is an augmented citizen, is an augmented consumer, uh, and they're going to require augmented services. So if they're going to come to your organization, uh, they are going to need to be able to do great work uh, there, uh, and so they'll be demanding augmented services uh, from the, uh, the HR function. Next, please. So if we look at the enterprise that they are entering into increasingly, this factory model is starting to uh, fall apart, but of course we still have a lot of organizations that run in a very kind of hierarchical uh, process manual type uh, mode, but increasingly organizations are focusing on their agility, how quickly they can respond to the market. Some people even talk about anticipatory organizations and even attentive organizations. So they're not looking for a specific threat or opportunity, but they are primed should any such threat or opportunity uh, arise. And such organizations are constantly experimenting. So there's a kind of concept of failing fast. And we are not traditionally comfortable with failing at all. Our education systems typically encourage us to get 10 out of 10 rather than 0 out of 10 fail. So one of the new, you might say, themes of uh, digital enterprises is this notion of failing fast. And this in turn causes organizations to move from being institutions to becoming really a series of experiments. And so strategy and tactics start to blur somewhat. And the need for people is very much based on the experiment or the portfolio of experiments that are happening at this current time. So from a staffing perspective, I suspect we're going to see a, a greater increase in terms of freelance type work. And that will similarly suit um, the talent, so to speak, because they are, they are looking to kind of not so much have uh, one employer, one career, but more likely to have multiple careers with multiple employer stroke uh, clients. And the very, very talented people will be highly in demand. We're already aware that there is a talent war uh, going on out there. And as the... Uh, focus moves from selling products to selling services and from services to experiences. Increasingly, these experiences will be made up either by uh, technology interfaces or by um, people. But these people, 
including the people that develop the technology interfaces, will be genuinely talented, will be genuinely creative. And it's very unlikely that there will be a human in the organization unless they are in some way contributing to a differentiated uh, customer experience. That type of talent is going to be very difficult to come by. But because the experience will increasingly be related to the underlying talent, customers will very likely follow that talent wherever it goes. So I would say to organizations that it is better to focus on attracting and retaining the best talent than attracting and retaining the best customers. There are plenty of customers out there. There's only a limited amount of talent. Next slide, please. So let's look at this from the talent's perspective. As young people start to look at their parents and think, well, my parents played, played the game well, they got all the toys of success, but they never had time to enjoy it, and they always seem to be in a constant state of distraction, I'm going to take a, a different perspective. I'm going to be more of an artist. I'm going to do great work, and I'm only going to work in organizations that offer me the opportunity uh, to do great work. There is, in fact, a race to the bottom. Organizations are automating people out of the business, but when they get to the bottom, as in the banks, they're heading that way fast, they will say, how do we move up the value stack again? And they will start to bring people back in. But these people won't be uh, suit-wearing corporate compliant cogs. These people will be uh, creatives, the Lady Gagas, the Andy Warhols, the Salvador Dalis, and so on. A nightmare, of course, from a HR perspective. But these people are doing things that technology cannot do, and that's where their value proposition lies. Malcolm Gladwell, Daniel Pink, and so on have talked about the need for work to be purposeful, uh, challenging, and a correlation between uh, reward and output. And there's a definite power shift uh, from the employer to the employee. That's the thing we've got to wake up to. BYOF, you might have heard of bring your own device. Well, that's only the start of it. Uh, next, it's going to be bring your own team, bring your own data center, and even bring your own family. So we're, we're, we're aware of the notion of the crash, bringing your own kids to work, but also bringing your elderly parents or even bringing your father in to negotiate the salary on your behalf. So, you know, be aware that the family is going to be involved very likely with your top talent. And it's all very well having, um, you know, super brains in your organization, but we need, to, we need to connect them together. So think of collaboration and collaboration technologies as being very important to enable great people to work together to do even greater work. You might say it's a kind of collect, collective consciousness. And because people or the next generation of talent are less focused on money and more focused on doing great work, they will become uh, increasingly economically optimized. So they're not chasing the money so much. And if they're not chasing the money so much, they have more economic options. So you might say they, were, they are entering into a world of abundance. So you can think of them in some respects as a digital hunter-gatherer. Next slide, please. So if we look at this from a, a leadership uh, perspective, uh, the carrot and stick, the hierarchical model, it doesn't work. It implies that all the intelligence is in the boardroom, when in fact all the intelligence is in everybody in the organization. And in any case, hierarchical organograms just uh, make the organization, um, how can I say, arthritic in terms of the speed of decision making. Businesses are increasingly being built around the app, so the business strategy is increasingly being built around the app. Then again, strategy and tactics are merging. And the concept of the jagged resume, that is uh, 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 people are going to be less judged on their formal qualifications, their attainments, so to speak, and actually more broadly judged on their character, life experiences that they've had, perhaps even time spent in prison, particularly if they've run a gang and you're looking for a, somebody to lead uh, an organization in a, in a very kind of, let's say, dangerous part of the world. And also our value will increasingly come from our social networks. 
So our connectivity to the wider world of expertise is going to increasingly be part of our value proposition. And, and leaders of organizations and HR functions uh, need to realize that and perhaps be less focused on the formal qualifications and more focused on the, the life experiences and the unusual backgrounds that can be brought to bear to, again, create differentiated customer experiences. Uh, next slide, please. So in talking to um, the candidates, the talent themselves, and I've covered this in, in more detail in, in the book, I do encourage them to treat their own careers like a, a lean startup. So uh, an ongoing prototype, you test the market, you see what your value is worth, you change your skill set in line with what the market needs. And the goalposts are always moving in such a volatile market. If the goalposts haven't moved, for some time, you're probably standing on the wrong pitch, so to speak. So we have to just realize that as good as our intentions are in terms of where we want to go with our career, uh, it's going to change on a very, very rapid basis. We have to follow where the market demand is. And we do need to be clear on our metrics. Our metrics might be how much money can we make, uh, how much discretionary time we have, how many countries we're going to visit, what great outputs we're going to produce. Uh, the talent needs to be crystal clear on the metrics on which they're going to judge their career success, and then the game is to match uh, those KPIs, so to speak, uh, with what your organization has to offer. So in turn, HR uh, functions and talent um, providers need to understand what drives the talent, and that's a very personal thing. I also encourage in the book... Uh, the talent not to do things because that's going to impress their friends or it's going to look good on LinkedIn uh, or it's going to make their parents happy. Everybody's too busy to care about everybody else. So you simply have to do what you're passionate about. Otherwise, um, you're going to come to a grinding halt. There's going to be great demands placed on you if you're great talent, but if your heart's not in it, uh, then it's not going to be a great experience for those that employ you or, or work with you. And the other thing is we have to keep developing. This notion that you go to university at the start of your career, i.e. front load your education, might well work if you're, and be important if you're a neurosurgeon, but for most of us, we need to pick up our learning as we, as we move along our career. So learning becomes less of a, how can I say, one-off lifetime inoculation and more uh, a series of tablets or daily daily uh, series of tablets uh, next slide please so in summary uh, the talent is in the driving seat the talent is very demanding uh, and the talent needs to be able to offer things capabilities that cannot be offered by a computer because those of us that are doing a job that can be done by technology, uh, the job will be done by technology in due course. So it will be the talent that differentiates organizations increasingly. So the irony, you might say, of the digital age is that it's about people. And for that reason, I think it's a golden era for those of us that are you know, working in HR. So that's my, uh, that's my presentation. And if there are any questions, please, please fire away. Thank you so much, Aidan. We actually do have some questions. The first one is, how would you define talent? Well, talent uh, is used very generically in general in terms of, you know, we talk about personnel, we talked about human resources. But again, talent in the digital age is people who can do things that computers cannot do. What computers cannot do very well at this point in time is they can't be creative. Um, they are not particularly good at spotting patterns amongst the noise, so to speak. So I would say, you know, skills like creativity or creativity and innovation in particular, very, very important uh, in terms of uh, what it means to be talent in the digital economy. Now, why do you believe talented employees are more important than customers? You mentioned that in your presentation. 
I did, I did touch on that, and it is quite a controversial point because as we've come out of the post Lehman recession, there's been a tremendous focus on the customer experience, the digital customer experience, and you know basically building customer centricity into your organisation, which I do think is very, very important. But I think if you weigh it up, you know having a great customer list without the talent, you soon won't have a great customer list. So I encourage organizations to really invest in their talent because they um, will be like honey. They will draw uh, the customers to the organization. So now, to what extent are we entering a golden age for the HR department? Well, I think there's every possibility that we are entering a golden age for the HR department. But, uh, you know, you see blogs all the time along the lines of why people love to hate HR. So HR perhaps has a branding issue in respect of the leadership team. I've been surprised for quite some time as to why HR is not represented in the boardroom, you know, if people are so important to the organization. In many respects, I don't think the boardroom gets it. That's one issue. The other point is, is that HR perhaps needs to downplay the administrative aspects of onboarding and um, managing talent um, whilst with the organization and be a bit more, if you like, um, forward thinking in terms of talent analytics, uh, using wearable technology to help the talent and help the organization perform better. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for HR to reinvent itself, to be truly managers of, of what I've described as talent. Okay, so now what can organizations do to improve their attractiveness to the best talent? Well, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, given that people are not um, necessarily economically driven, though, though some uh, will be, uh, it's almost like one's choice of clothing or one's choice, you know, basically your, your, your employer, your client becomes a lifestyle statement. So you have to ask yourself, is your organization one that people would be proud to be associated with? I think the closer you can get to the kind of saving the planet end of the market, uh, the better. The other extreme might be indirectly killing children through selling diabetic inducing or diabetes inducing confectionery, difficult sell to the candidate or selling uh, landmines, for example. It's going to be quite difficult. It's going to be quite difficult to dress that up as something that will help somebody uh, lead a purposeful life through working with you. So some organizations are going to find it very, very difficult. But I guess it's a case of not just having a corporate and social responsibility policy, but having that actually been at the center of your business. And my last question for you today is, is a very generous compensation package still the nuclear option if an organization simply wants to get the best talent with the minimum of fuss? Well, in certain sectors, I think that is the case, and probably the closer you get to investment banking, uh, the more likely that is. But what I do believe is happening, that whilst you know, my generation valued um, discretionary money so that they could buy a lifestyle, uh, the uh, next generation are looking at discretionary time. They recognize they've only got a certain amount of time on the planet, there's only a certain number of experiences they can savor before they move on, so to speak. So I think increasingly throwing money at uh, the talent is not going to work. Now that is very interesting. So thank you so much, Aid, for being our guest today. And thank you for attending this Collins Recruiter webinar. The subject of today's discussion was on Beyond 9 to 5, Acquiring and Retaining Talent in the Digital Age. My name is Andrea McEwen-Henderson, and I was your host today. I am one of the national account managers with College Recruiter. I have a dozen years of experience in helping large and small employers reach recent college graduates and students. My primary responsibilities are facilitating our webinars, moderating the discussions at our college recruiting boot camp conferences, 
as well as working with small to medium-sized employers on their entry-level hiring needs. College Recruiter is the highest traffic college job board with 150,000 unique monthly visitors. We help employers reach recent graduates and students of one, two, and four-year colleges and graduate schools. We have permission to deliver emails on behalf of our employer clients to 7 million recent graduates and 10 million students and can also target them by major, school, year graduation, diversity, and more. On our other solutions for employers include job postings, targeted mobile banner ads, targeted display ads, virtual career fairs, and custom research projects. For more information about College Recruiter, you can reach us at www.collegerecruiter.com forward slash contact or 952-848-2211. Today's guest was Abe McCormick, author of Beyond 9 to 5, your career guide for the digital age. Thank you for joining us today.